He's with us despite 35 minutes last night. George Niang joining the show again. How are you doing, man, after 35 of them? Um, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm doing well. I mean, I've never heard of a, a professional athlete complain about playing more um, when they are playing more. So I'm definitely not going to uh, complain. But uh, I got a, a lot of appreciation for those guys that have been doing it for a long time. So two claps for you guys. Let's let's go back to this summer. Um, you know, we, we had you on. We know about your career. You're a lot of fun to talk to. Um, but when I was looking at that deal, I was so happy for you. W- what was the moment? Like, is there a moment you can share with us when, you know, when you look at the the numbers, I think like this year you're making just less than your career earnings to finally feel like, okay, I've arrived and I've got an actual multi-year deal. Yeah. I mean, to think about like five years ago, I was playing for 50 grand for the Santa Cruz Warriors in Santa Cruz, California to now, you know, making, you know, eight, eight plus million dollars is, is, uh, obviously life changing and it's, uh, incredible, but it's uh, a credit to the people that have, uh, been around me to push me and, uh, and allow me to be myself. Um, you know, obviously the money is one thing, but, you know, to be able to continue to play the game, I think is another, and I'm going into, or this is year eight. Um, so it, it's been amazing. And, uh, I think a moment that, you know, it really hit me was, you know, people say that Woj bomb, you know, when that came out, I was like, holy shit, like this isn't like someone telling me on the phone what the deal is. Like everybody knows about this. So this has to be real. Um, like there's no turning back now. And uh, that was kind of the moment where I was like, damn, like this is, this is it. But at the same time, you know, I also realized like this is when expectation comes next to your name. And that's where people don't understand that, you know, when there's a dollar sign next to your name, there's expectation to play well. And if you don't play well, uh, you could be on the move fairly quickly as we've seen in trade deadlines and off seasons, um, from your, from years past. But you brought up a really good point though, because you know, anybody that gets to a certain level and you're hearing like a rumor and you have your agent say, well, this might happen or this could happen. And then when it doesn't happen, um, I don't know that you were ever in this, this neighborhood money wise with thinking things could happen, but all the stops Uh along the way. I I imagine there were times you're like, okay, I finally found a home and then it wasn't home. Yeah. It seemed like every stop on the way was kind of like that. Huh? I mean, uh, I definitely thought Utah was going to be there and I was replaced by, uh, you know, Rudy Gay. Uh, and then I kind of thought Philly was going to be somewhere. And then, you know, obviously they had their multitude of things that had to happen. So that wasn't it. And, uh, you know, obviously reconnecting with Donovan here in Cleveland has been uh, really great for me. I enjoyed my time, you know, playing alongside him when I was in Utah. So to get reacclimated with him and the pieces like Max Struess, um that we've brought in has been a, a really good fit for me. They needed shooting. They needed a veteran guy, and, and I was able to offer that. But like you said, in the ballpark of, of that um, money annually, um, you know, it, it, it definitely is, is a dream come true. That's for sure. Whenever I look at teams that are rebuilding and clearly you're not, and there's a lot of cap stuff that I want to get into here, but yeah, when a team's like, okay, we're starting over rebuilding, rebuilding through the draft, like, okay, totally get it. But there always felt like there was this need that everybody had to be like 22 or younger. <laughs> and yeah. I don't think it makes a lot of sense because it was explained to me by GM years ago was you can't have... 12 to 14 guys in a roster are all thinking they're supposed to be an all-star. It just doesn't really work that way. So what does a veteran do? Like there's the difference between your role as a vet now with some of your younger players, but this team is more established, but what does the vet do that we don't understand from the outside, whether it was when you were younger or what you're doing now? Um, You know, I think it goes back to, you know, even when you're like in school, right? Like the teacher will, tell you to do something, which will say that the teachers are considered like coaches. Right. And, you know, as a collective group, if you're the classmates, you're like, yeah, like I'm not, I'm not doing that. You know what I mean? So (laughs) when you have a veteran that, you know, it would be considered like the classmates or like the, the, the team, you know, you want that guy to lead by example. So, you know, coming in every day and getting treatment, taking care of your body, eating right, you know, lifting, um, getting shots up and 
showing these guys that this is actually like a job. Like I know you guys think like AAU, you can walk in with your big headphones, your sandals on, you know, go in windmill dunk. And you know, that's, Oh, I got my shots up today going half ass, but like you need an older guy that's going to come in and set the tone every single day and help these guys build habits that, you know, they're doing it right next to them. Cause a strength coach, a head coach, an assistant coach, a development coach can only push you so much. But if your peers are sitting right next to you um, and they're doing it, you, you get peer pressured into being like, well, I can't let them down. I have to do it. And that's almost why you want to have a couple of veterans on the team to hold these guys accountable. And uh, you know, when they need it in practice, you know, no 22 year old kid wants to get their ass bust by a, a 30 plus year old veteran. Let me tell you that you get your ass bust enough. You're going to think twice about your habits and your routine. And uh, so it, I think it's extremely important where people don't see the value of these glue guys, of these veteran guys, is they're constantly working uh, with these young guys to build these habits, to have them think the game of basketball. Because in college, the season happens, you play one, two games a week, whatever. In the NBA, there's 82 games and you have to stick to a routine. Otherwise, you fall so far behind. And when you're so far behind, that's when 10 game losing streets happen. That's when shooting slumps, career lows, where you want these guys to have a routine that a lot of veterans know how to have a routine so that they can continue to build on this where their career is going like this rather than they're playing catch up their whole front end of their career. And, and they're saying in like year five or six, damn, I wish I would have known X, Y, or Z. I would have been so much better. Who was the best veteran you had when you were younger? Ooh, can I, can I, uh, so year one, it was definitely Al Jefferson. Like he set the tone for me with like what was expected, like as like a rookie, right? When I was, it was rookie, like Jeff- entry, entry passes. I get 20 post ups a game. Yeah. Not even, it was more like off the court stuff. Like, I know, I Hey, know. like, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> entry passes. That is funny. That left block Al Jefferson still owns real estate on that left block. Um, but he would show me the way of like, you know, if, if I'm a rookie, I have to get the towels for all the guys and put them on their seats before, you know, the end of the game or right when we get in from the end of the game or like every shoot around on the road, he'd make me get him a bacon, egg and cheese and a coffee, you know, and, or before, after shoot arounds, he'd make me get him Jimmy John's and two potato chips and a bottle of water. Like it was those things that the rookie duties that you had to do where I learned and was instilled in my mind you know, rookies kind of had to earn their keep no matter who you were. That's what, uh, that's what you had to do. And that was more for like the off the court stuff, because, you know, as you talked about our journey, I was so bad in Indiana to start off my career that there wasn't really much to teach me on the court. So moving on, I get to, uh, Utah and that's where Joe Ingles kind of took me under his wing. And, uh, you know, he's a savvy, you know, I would say somewhat athletic guy, probably a little more athletic than me but, you know, kind of had the same skill set. Um, and he kind of showed me the tricks of the trade of, you know, how to be a reliable, you know, defensive guy, how to pick your spots on offense and, uh, have the ultimate confidence to shoot as many threes as you want. Um, me and Joe are still close to, to this day, but that's definitely a veteran that taught me how to talk a little shit too. Let's talk about the cast. I can't figure you guys out. Um, and, and I mean that almost as a compliment. And one is like you put together some of these stretches and you go, well, okay, do I have to look at them as like a real contender coming out of the East? Because you know how good Boston is. We know what Milwaukee's track record is. This is pre the Embiid injury. You go 17 and one. And that was without Garland and Mobley for a long stretch of that. Um, it's, it's obviously cooled off in like an unrepeatable stretch, but what is this team? Because when I look at the East, I don't want to be dismissive, but I'm I'm just not there yet. Maybe that has more to do with Boston. Yeah, no, I, I completely understand that. Um, we have so many pieces on this team, and we've had so many injuries and guys being out that, you know, we are blending and molding with the pieces that we have. And then when we get everybody back, it's like, we're really trying to continue to build on like, all right, this is everybody that we have here. And this is how we're trying to build. It seems like every time we get our full roster back, you know, someone either has a sprained ankle or someone gets injured. 
Um, and I think the biggest thing for us is the strength of our team, you know, is our team is that we have so much depth, but I think moving forward, you want to find your core nine, 10 guys that you're going to ride with. And, uh, you know, obviously we can't do that cause guys are out, but I think moving forward over these next 13 games, we're definitely going to figure out who we're going to be rolling with and what we're going to do. I think the adding shooting has, has definitely helped and will give guys like Darius Donovan, Karras space you know to operate and then you have you know the two giants and evan mobley and, and jared allen which you know anchor our defense protect the rim and uh gather a shit ton of uh offensive rebounds obviously boston poses its challenges i think for everybody with their ability to space the floor and, and their size um but looking back on us um i think the biggest thing that we'll have to do is continue to take and make shots and and space teams out um, and I think our defense is is really what we hold our hat on, you know, moving forward. When Boston has it flying, it's it's really scary. Okay, but yeah, the we, we saw don't... it the other week ago, <laughs> right? But then you also had the comeback uh, against them not that yeah. long ago either, where, where Dean Wade turned into Steph Curry. So <laughs> when when you look at this, is kind of the you know I have some other questions about other teams in the East, but I want to get back to Cleveland here. But I'll just. I'll allow this, I guess. Well, it's my podcast, so I can do it. But do you think there is, it's not a fatal flaw, but that Boston becomes a little easier to defend when they're so reliant on threes at times? You know what? I was just telling someone that. Whereas, like, when I was, when we were in Philly, like, the game would get close. And not to say we won anything in Philly, like, because, you know, people are going to, I'm going to see the comments when you post this, like, oh, you guys didn't win anything. Like, all right, I get it. But when we were in Philly and we needed a two, like, we had, like, the ace of spades to go get a two point bucket. Whether if it was, like, a, a duck in or a mid range jumper, like, Joel could get us a, 70 80 percent shot like sometimes when you watch boston and when we played them when they went through these lulls like they were so dependent on these jumpers if you'd be in a drop they see that the three-point shot was the first thing that's open and and they're going to take it and granted they're a really good three-pointing shooting team i'm not taking anything away from them but as you know people go through slumps teams go through slumps and if you can get them to be reliant on taking a bunch of jump shots when they're not hot, you have a pretty solid chance. But over the course of a seven-game series, they do have a chance to get hot four out of those seven games, which you know hurts. But at the same time, we've also seen it come back to bite them in the ass, i.e., you know, the Miami series last year where they baited them to shoot. And I don't know, you tell me, do you think they have a guy that can go get them a um for sure two at any time? Uh, during yeah, I, think, the game. I do think Tatum has that, uh, you know, whenever I'm even remotely critical of him, it's, it's kind of like how I talk about you guys. Like, I like your team. I know how good you yeah. are, but then it's OK. But am I seriously looking at the Cavs as a chance to, like, win the East? And then I have a hard time getting there. And with Boston, right. the criticism is only will they win the whole thing? If they don't win it this year, it's the most disappointing season probably a team could have. And that sounds ridiculous to getting to the NBA Finals, but that's what they've been building towards. So I'll only look at them like with a far more critical lens. And when I go and look through the numbers to see if do they really fall off this cliff, it's like, I don't think so. Like when they blew the game to you guys, I think they just stopped closing out. I think they, they let Dean hit the three or four. They didn't box out because they were up 20. I just see too many yeah. NBA games where a team is up big and you just stop doing the stuff that you're supposed to do. It's the same thing with football. You know, a team will be up 21-3 or 21-7 and then it's like, I'm just not going to block as hard now. Like, this thing's <laughs> almost over. Um, yeah. So, look, that, that's what I see. Look, I want to go back to you guys, though, because you you mentioned it with you coming in with Struess. There's a different combination of a closing unit here that I think gives a different look. And after last year, in the Knicks series, you know, I had a moment. And again, these are just thoughts that I have out loud without even having a, a definitive answer. I was like, wait, with the defensive numbers that Cleveland has had with Mobley, who was terrific last year with Allen, I was like, does that actually clog them up a bit offensively? And it seems like 
even if Mobley's back and healthy and the closing group is Garland, Mitchell, the two bigs, and then you figure out who the fifth guy is, if it's a curl for defense, if it's if it's shooting with Struess, if it's you for a defensive matchup, like at least there's a better option than maybe only having one or two with Lavert or a Coral last year. But is there anything that lingers from last year's playoff experience, knowing you weren't a part of it, that you hear about or, or it's just discussed with this group going into the playoffs this year? Yeah, you know, I, I think more or less it was their first year getting into the the playoffs in a little while, and the guys that were here their first time playing in the playoffs. And I'll tell you, you know, playoff experience is is real, and uh, I would definitely say from a toughness standpoint, you know, they're in uh, no place to repeat what happened uh, last year. I, I think the toughness aspect of that is not going in and and getting punked. You know, that that's not an that's not a viable option. Um, you know, the defensive numbers speak for themselves, but at the same time in the playoffs, you know, you know, just as good as I know, it's a, it's a toughness battle on who's going to give in first. And uh, I think that's something that these guys are well aware of and realize that this season is a year where, you know, it's not going to be repeated as last year where, you know, getting out physical out rebound, like, that's no longer an option. Someone is going to get put on their ass before they think they can just walk in the paint and continuously offensive rebound and try and out physical us. That's, that's one thing that, you know, I think has been harped on since God, September. So, um, you know, now it's, it's just time to prove that. Let's fast forward these 13 games. Huh? Who is the one player in the East that changes the most of what you do defensively as far as your prep where you're like okay this is the guy and now we have to kind of change all of our rules i mean well we're we're if we're talking at that point i think it's the guy that you know is in philadelphia i think you know you have a guy like uh joel Embiid who offers so much attention right with him being on the court he um you just have to always have an IM, always have a guy ready to get the ball out of his hands, whether if it's a double team or, you know, I would say a triple team or having a guy loaded up and helping. Um, but then you go along and you look at Boston and where they, you know, present their challenges are is, you know, you want to take away the paint in the NBA, right? You want to not give these elite athletes, elite basketball players, rhythm with shots at the rim and and easy shots close in the paint so you want to take that away but boston has al horford perzingis you know tatum brown Derek white drew holiday all guys that can shoot 40 plus especially if they're open and sometimes there's no real option to take away you know just everybody and they pose their challenges because they all play on the perimeter um, so there's no one guy that you can f- funnel everybody into to help. So that's why um, Boston is as dangerous as they are. I have a theory based on limited handle sampling, but is Sam Merrill okay. really, is he really tough to deal with one-on-one when you guys are screwing around? Because I think there's way more to him than just the shooting. Oh, yeah. I I, I don't think Sam Merrill uh, gets enough credit, you know, especially with his journey in mentally how he's had to, you know, literally you get, you win a championship, you get waived or cut because of money purposes, which is like, has nothing to do with your skill. Like imagine being told, yeah, you know, we're letting you go. Cause not cause you're not good enough because, you know, we just, we don't want to be in the second apron or I don't know what exactly what it was, but then he fights back to kind of get an opportunity and he's only showing you that, you know, he's an elite quick trigger shooter. I mean, I saw the comparison, which is I'm not comparing them, but it was like per 36 with like Steph Curry and how many threes they get up. And I was like, wow, Sam, you know, in, in 15 to 17 minutes, you really can hum them up there and shoot them at a high clip. Um, but he's also had games where he's had like nine, 10 assists. Um, you know, so I don't think people understand with a team, everybody has like a role and the role needs to be played. And I'll make a crazy comment here. And this is why I never think like big threes or whatever, like all these superstars coming together are going to work because it just devalues the value of glue guys that 
do the little things that people don't see that kind of bring a team all together. Like you look at Denver last year, like, sure, you want to say their big three is Jamal Murray, Jokic, and and Michael Porter. But like Aaron Gordon coming in and being able to play the low post and the dunker spot while Jokic is operating at the free throw line is like a glue guy that, you know, you really need. Or Bruce Brown being able to be subbed in and guard the other team's best perimeter player. Like you can't just get three superstars or four superstars and think that you can just fill all the other spots with just guys that are willing to take a minimum and, uh, and win games. And I know it's a hot take, but I just think that that is not the way to a championship. And it's kind of shown itself here the last couple of years. You can't just throw pieces together and expect it to just happen like lightning in a bottle. I like how you preface this already countering the comments that will come your way as a seasoned podcaster. I can see the the skills that you're developing. You're, you're <laughs> making a point, but you're also trying to get in front of all the points that are coming. Uh, you've got the bench seat, which is uh, yes. a weekly show uh, with Kevin Spies, a.k.a. Grill Guy, on Instagram and TikTok. Um, what are you enjoying about this which is just absurd growing up thinking like active athletes can all just have outlets now to the media but now it's it's obviously been normalized now for years but is this something you actually want to do yeah i mean now you're my competitor so i don't even know why i'm on here or you're having me on here we're competitors now no um you know i've always loved doing this like i could sit around you know probably I've sat around one too many times in South Boston and, and had these types of sports talks and talking shit like anybody else had. And I just, it's kind of an outlet for me and something that I've always been passionate about. I can, I can talk anybody's ear off, but you know, I love sports. I've always loved sports and being able to have a podcast, the bench sheet with, you know, like you said, with, with Kevin Spees, um, it's been awesome. And I think the the coolest part is we've kind of added a comedic twist to it. I think, you know, there's some podcasts where every host or co-host thinks they know everything and that isn't how we kind of spin it. We have our hot takes, we have our opinions, whether if it's on hockey, football, um, or basketball, which is kind of the mainstream of what I know. Um, just be, being able to talk through it and, and give people my background information with my experiences that I've had in professional sports um, I think it's something that I want to do long term, but as you know, uh, things are always changing. So I hope it's with the bench sheet, or you never know. I'm I may be trying to come hop on a show with you that friggin' take over the world. I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> All right, I got a couple more things here. The fouling. I lost my mind on a podcast a couple months ago where I was just. It was after one of those six, seven hour nights of watching games where I was like, you can't keep allowing yeah. the offensive player to initiate all this contact. And now in a very short amount of time, it feels like it's real. The numbers back it up. Okay. So what are you, what are you experiencing on the court? How different does it feel for you with how different you can be physically in the last few weeks? Oh, I got some advice for anybody playing in these next 13 games. Don't drive to the hoop. And, and, and look for any of that. You're not getting it, which, you know, the game is constantly evolving. Like, you know, you, you watch this game like a hawk, right. And and for you to see that, that it's, it's kind of done the opposite. I mean, something had to be done. Like, you know, games were in the one fifties. Nobody really wants to watch that stuff. And, uh, we're grown men. You know, I think, you know, some guys are going to have to fight through a little contact and, uh, I got a technical last night and I'll be the first one to tell you, I'm sitting here saying that they should allow more contact, but when I'm have a chance to score, I'm like, that's a, he's hitting me. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's good for the game and it kind of implements, I wasn't even around for the eighties or the nineties, but it kind of implements that old school mentality where our, Again, I'm going to say this, our generation has kind of gotten somewhat, you know, soft where if someone gets touched or if they lose the ball, they're complaining that they got touched that it's fouled. where it kind of gives you that 80s, 90s mentality where it's like, yeah, you are going to get grabbed, touched or hit, but who's going to be able to push through that and actually make a play? 
Well, what I've noticed too, like Jalen Brunson's a good example. So when I started seeing things get more physical, I was like, wait, is Jalen Brunson going to struggle with some of this stuff? And it's like, no, he's going to score 40 like every night. Like that game against Golden State, he was the best player on the floor. He was, he was unbelievable the way he controls everything. So I thought it was too easy for too many people. But when I look at the best players, it's not like all of a sudden the guys at 30 points a game are going to start going to 20 points a game because the usage is another thing on top of it all, too. So I'm glad it happened because I just felt like the defensive player was getting to a point where it was like, I don't even know. Like, I'm just supposed to get out of the way now. I yeah, I, I completely hear you. It was almost like the defensive player was handcuffed. Like, why don't you just play with your hands behind your back? Um, and even then, like it was offensive players were ramming into defensive players and falling over. And it's like, if I don't hold my ground, he's going to lower his shoulder. You're not going to call offensive foul and I'm going to be knocked off my spot. And as you know, these are NBA players. They need a small amount of space to be able to make a shot at a, at a high clip. So being able to be more physical, I think is huge, especially leading up to the playoffs where, you know, it's like. It's it's a really a war out there. Like it, the fouls are not called, and it's a fight, and and you better be ready for fouling to happen because it's going to happen. And what team is going to fight through that? But you're also you know right when you say these you know skilled players, you know some of them it it, it doesn't affect them. And as much as I hate bringing up Jalen Brunson because I am in a Cleveland Cavaliers uniform, and uh, he's he's done a tremendous job of being able to you know, fight through any uh, circumstance. That's for sure. All right. I want to talk about a foul that you committed the other night. It was against the Pacers. You're up two. They've got the ball. You've got Siakam pinned on the sideline. Get the the fuck out of here. I think you knew what you were doing. (laughs) Listen, all I know (laughs) is that if the ball is being taken out and you're going to get the ball, you don't run to the sideline. The way they tell you when you first start basketball, the sideline, the half-court line, the baseline is another defender. So I ran as close as I could get to him, denying the ball until he caught it. And, uh, you know, I was really good in science. And an object in motion stays in motion until it's stopped by something, an outside force. Well, there's no outside force on the sideline. So... Therefore, I got as close as I could. As soon as he, you know, his momentum stopped, he wanted to start yelling and screaming like, you know, like Pascal Siakam does every time he drives to the hoop. Hey! And the ref made a call, and I am so thankful that my good man, uh, Dan Vincent behind the bench uh, for the Cleveland Cavaliers, who, who who's usually telling JB to do this, said to challenge it. But that wasn't a foul. I mean, are we really – the bumping and stuff that goes on all over the court, we were really going to call it? I mean, what do you think? I'd love to hear your opinion on this. No, I, I'm i having fun with you. It was overturned, for the record, as, as you mentioned here. Um, I thought it was a, just a good, good closeout. I think you kind of knew you were going to get your body on him a little bit, but you kept the arms oh, my back. Be- and then he, my belly on him? You put, you put the old six-pack on him, <laughs> and he wasn't <laughs> ready for one. it. Right. Uh, you know what I noticed with that? And I'm not going to say what JB said because the camera caught him at a moment where, you know, he probably wouldn't love me sharing this. And I think enough people missed it that they didn't see it. But it seemed to be like joy for him to challenge it for Siakam because he had said something to the ref very specific about Siakam and his. Yeah. Uh, it, and it was. It felt like it was a little bit extra. I don't know if it's a Pacers Cavs thing. I don't know if it was because it was a tight game, but J- JB was heated. And then once it was overturned, the joy that he had, granted, it was a huge possession too, because now you get the ball up too under a minute. I just, I felt like I noticed something and I could really sell this even more if I said the quote that I could read his lips saying, but I'm not going to do that to him because it was, was it, it was, was very it like specific. F O H or something? It was, uh, <laughs> It does was it, along does, those does lines. the second half of it have to the second half of the word head. starts with an F. No. No, it starts with an yeah, F. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. I think we get it. Hey. Okay. All right. I, I, I think we got it. Okay. Uh last one. Last one here. I have I have a theory on Donovan Mitchell. I know he's your guy. Everybody wants to talk about his future. Yeah. I think him rocking the Cavs hat has to make people feel a little bit better, right? <laughs> Um, he's not yeah. playing? I mean, I, I, 
uh, I uh, I don't like speaking on other people's futures, but you know, from the vibes that I get around here, um, and from what I was with them in Utah and our experiences over there, I would uh, I would lean towards him, you know, being a cavalier for a long time, um, and and that's just my personal thought. That has nothing to do with what he's going to do because he's his own person, and um, but I think he genuinely enjoys this organization, the situation that he's in, um, and how it can continue to help grow his career and his ability to win. Uh, when I first got here, you know, and I got to sit down and talk with him, you know, face to face, obviously we, we've talked on the phone before that. Um, but he was essentially just like, I really think we can do it here. And, uh, and I want to continue to keep building pieces here, you know, to, to continue and try and win. And, uh, I know he's under contract, but, um, I think he's going to be here for a long time. And I think that hat will be staying on. That's my personal opinion. Well, many Cavs fans will be thrilled to hear that one because you can start playing it all out and going like, well, wait a minute. What? And sometimes I wonder too, like if it's just the rest of us talking about something and we just keep repeating the same stuff to each other in the rumor mill of stuff and then it turns into something else. But now, look, you answered that about as well as a teammate could ever possibly answer it. So I don't want to continue to put you but in a weird if, spot But if that. he were to leave, but if he were to leave, you want me to tell you where I think he's going? <laughs> Does the PR guy next to you want you to tell me this? I think he'd I go do. play. I think he'd go play for the uh, New York Mets playing baseball. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to use this as the breakout video. Then Niang says yes. Mitchell for the Mets. Perfect, <laughs> George. You're always a blast, man. I'll uh, uh, I'll tell everybody back home you you said hello and make sure you check yeah. out the bench seat with Kevin Spees and George. Uh, that is a weekly podcast. Go subscribe out. on YouTube.